Who is uh, who's coming from a non-developer background here? Is there anyone? Okay. Who? Yeah, this should be a good start for you. And who is uh, like from the experienced developers? Maybe who is already familiar with the concept? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Then, what do you want to learn more about clean code? <laughs> what is clean? Yeah. Well, uh, the point is that. Uh, if you say to someone, your code is bad, it just won't change anything. Like, you see the code you understand is bad, but uh, what you need are some principles. So that if you give to the person some principles, they would be able to use it like a map. Uh, where they would be able to see where they stand and where they want to go uh, using those principles. A uh, couple of words about myself. I'm a platform developer since 2014. I started my Salesforce journey in Italy, in a Salesforce boutique. Um, it's not only Gucci's in Milan. And uh, today I'm coming from Berlin, uh, where I work for SumUp, uh, which is a leading payment solution provider and one of the fastest growing companies in Europe. Um, yeah, so little disclaimer, I'm not going to do any forward-looking statements, uh, but I'm going to show you some code. And while you may or may not agree with some parts of that code, um, I'd like to ask you to focus on the principles and how you would apply the principles in your or your team's work. So what is clean code? It's the one that is easier to read, understand, and change by human beings. Um, what happens if you don't have clean code? Um, it simply takes more time to read the code, understand it, and change it. Like in a cluttered kitchen, it will take more time to cook a breakfast. Uh, so here come the principles. It's the Boy Scout rule, uh, meaningful naming using constants uh, instead of hard-coded strings or integers, and small functions. Uh, the Boy Scout rule says always leave the campground cleaner than you found it. And uh, Robert Martin adapted this rule to programming world. Uh, and he said, always leave the code that you're editing uh, cleaner than you, you found it. Um, so the Boy Scout rule allows us to take responsibility of any kind of environment by uh, improving small things in that environment. So if you, you are in the forest and you see a pile of trash, you don't have to spend an entire weekend uh, cleaning that pile of trash. It's enough that you take one plastic bottle away, and you would make the entire environment better. And the same applies to code. Uh, if you're given an old legacy project where it's really hard to understand anything, but you need to change uh, just one class or page, it would be enough that you would change some names in that piece of code, and you would make the entire project better. And meaningful naming is the first, principles, first principle of those small things that we are looking to improve. Um, meaningful name is the one uh, that describes uh, the intention of a uh, uh, variable, uh, class, or method. It's not a single letter word, it's not an abbreviation, and it's easy to search. So that on the left, if you search for L, you will just find a bunch of Ls. If you search on the right side for new lead, you would know exactly how often we are working with new leads in that code. Um, so class names should be nouns or noun phrases, like customer or wiki page. And it's better to avoid generic words like manager or processor, because this way the class can easily become uh, um, dependent, uh, a magnet for things that are not related to that class. And uh, method names should be verb or verb phrases. And it's better to have longer name uh, than an ambiguous one. So that if you, if you see in the code, do rename, um, you don't know exactly what is going to be renamed. If you see your name page, then you know that uh, this function is working with pages. Um, and if you end up with some super long name, which has uh, some uh, ends in the, in the middle, um, that might mean that your function is too long, and it's time to break that function into a set of smaller ones, which we'll see later. Um, one way to uh, make variables more descriptive 
is to use variable type as part of its name so that uh, at each line of the code, you would know exactly with what, kinds, what kind of objects you're working with, uh, like parent account or reset button. And when it comes to collection, uh, it might be enough to use plural of uh, the object type so that if you see users, uh, you know that it's most likely a list of records of user objects. Um, for each project that you're working with, make sure that there is a simple naming, uh, formatting, and coding convention so that uh, any developer in your team or any developer that will work with that project at some point in future would know exactly what is a variable, what is a class, and what is a constant just by uh, knowing that naming convention. Um, of course, uh, whenever you change the code, uh, always make sure that names are still valid because names are those pieces that communicate to people who are reading the co that code. And it's easier to change private variable than a public one because if you have a public variable, you would have to change the name of it, you would have to look for references in the entire project. And instead, if you have a private one, you need to change the name only in one class. And now that your names are so much more meaningful, you can apply them and um, tell more about what the code is doing. So for example, if you have a regu regular expression that matches two groups in a string, uh, instead of just saying group one and group two, you can introduce intermediate variables and say what exactly group one is and what exactly group two is. And um, so here come the second principle and the shortest one. Uh, simply use constants instead of hard-coded strings or integers. Uh, human mind is uh, working with concepts uh, instead of some numbers or characters. Uh, it's simply easier to read and understand. Um, you can search for references of such constant so that you know exactly where do you work with uh, this company code in your class or maybe in, in the entire project. Um, it's obviously easier to change value of such constant. Um, and if the constant is a private one and used only in one class, you can add uh, test visible annotation and reference that constant in your test methods so that you wouldn't change values in your test methods as well. Small function, the last principle and my favorite, um, suggests us to, to split big functions into a set of smaller ones um, so that uh, the entire function would be in the field of view of the person who is reading it. Um, if function is small, it's, uh, you have to keep much less thing, things in mind. You can isolate uh, exactly this part of logic. And you can do that by looking at logical sections and in your bigger functions. Like if you know that your you clearly know that your function is doing A, then B, then C, then those uh, A, B, and C would become your smaller functions. Another way to identify a um, small function is uh, to look at the indentation level. Uh, if you have for loop, uh, nested for loops, if statements, etc., you can isolate the body of that for loop or an if statement uh, to a smaller function so that uh, the original function would work with collections on a higher level and small functions, small function would work with uh, single item in that collection. Um, less is better also applies to the number of arguments that you have in a function. Again, human mind is able to keep in its short-term mem memory on average only seven items. So if you are able to reduce it, then it's better for you and the one who will be reading and changing that code later. Uh, two ways to reduce the number of arguments. Uh, first is you can use 
static variables in a class so that each uh, function in the class would be able to access that static variable, or you can use an instance variable. Um, again, uh, it would be accessible to all the methods in the class. And if you are, if you need to um, transfer some data, uh, like uh, address, like an address, we have like street name, house number, and zip code. Uh, you can, instead of uh, making that parameters for every functions that work with addresses, you can isolate it in a data transfer object uh, that you can simply make an inner class and call it address. And if you would need to add to that address um, geographical coordinates at some later point of time, you would need to update only the class definition and not uh, the every signature of every method that is using uh, addresses. Now, now we start applying those principles. Uh, if, your, if, if in an if statement the condition has some intermediate calculations or it takes longer than one second to understand, uh, you can isolate it as a small function and make sure that you know uh, the standard function that we have in Apex or Lightning for null checks or emptiness check so that uh, you would be able to communicate in a human language. Um, Sokol queries. If you were given an, pro uh, an old legacy project that doesn't know about trigger frameworks or separation of concerns, uh, the small thing that you can improve is just take that Sokol query into a small function, nicely formatted, easier to uh, change, easier to reuse, and at a later point of time, uh, you can move that uh, small function into a special data access layer class. Um, so we were talking about keeping, reducing the indentation levels, and we can use small functions for that, but uh, in loops, we can use loop control statements like break or continue. So in the example on the left, when you, whenever you read the body of that if statement, you need to keep in mind if the condition still holds true. And uh, on the right, we are simply using continue statements so that the, the reading, reading flow would be linear. So you pass that condition once, and you don't need to remember it uh, when you read the code later. Uh, now that your code is so much more meaningful, uh, don't forget to remove comments that are no longer necessary because you explained what, the, what your code is doing already in your names of your variables, functions, and classes. And uh, now that your names are so much more meaningful, uh, you can have uh, a better debug statements. So it's enough to specify name of the class, name of the function, and name of your variable. And in the debug statement, in the debug log, you would know uh, where this debug statement is coming from and uh, what is going on. Uh, OK, now it's time to show some, some more code. Can you, can you see it? OK. So, so as you see in the beginning of the class, we have uh, constants that we later uh, use for for query. If at some later point of time, so this is a set of uh, strings. If if at some later point of time we would need to add some more conditions, uh, it would be enough to change this constant and you would not need to look down the code where, where else we are using those conditions. So next we have just one um, public function that is creating an instance of an inner class and starts their processing. So in this case, we are, it's a quote trigger that is triggering on a code update, and it is creating um, 
records of follow-up object, uh, given some conditions. So in that inner class, we have just um, just one public method that is that, tell, that tells us in a human language what exactly is going on in in this class. So it tells us um, first retrieve requests, so make a make a query, then prepare um, a mapping, and then use that mapping to create objects of type quote follow up. And then down below, we actually specify um, those details that, that we need to do. Um, so here we are building codes to process by IDs. And in an if statement, we are using uh, a small function that is saying to us in human language, um, what do we need to, to understand in, in that in that condition. And down below, you have more space to uh, check every condition so that it will be more readable and even say some comment if, if it's necessary. So this code um, is not perfect, of course. Probably architecturally, it could have been implemented better. But uh, as you've seen, it implements uh, some of those principles that we've seen earlier that allow us to um, understand what is going on. And if we need to change some piece of that logic, we would be able to uh, go down to exactly the small function that, that we need to change. And we would be able to, uh, to do it better just because it's, it's simpler to read and understand. Um, so what I'd like you to, what I'd like to change after this session is your vision. So that every time when you see uh, any, any kind of code, you would be able to see immediately what are those small things that you can improve to make this code better and make the entire project better. Uh, this talk is largely based on the book of Robert Martin. Uh, you can also watch uh, this three-hour plural site course where you, you would get much more uh, code examples. And here's an interesting course by Matt Ka Kaufman and Don Robbins, which uh, describes a success story, how a project has been saved just by introducing um, cleaner code. And now, um, you probably know that uh, the most effective way to promote best practices in a team are code reviews. And at the end of the session, I'd like to propose you a challenge. Uh, your job is to make groups of two or three people and decide exactly the date and time when you're going to meet. And each one of you is going to bring a piece of code. And together, you would review that piece of code and just discuss what contributes to better readability of that code and what could be improved. Um, yeah, let me know how, how did it go uh, on the Slack channel. Uh, you can download the slides of the session using this link uh, so that you can use, use it as a checklist when you will be doing that, that code review. Um, thank you for coming, and I wish you Many lines of clean talk. <laughs>